present, but you can stop me whenever you want. Uh, and we can discuss about uh, the different things and the, somewhere a presentation is a presentation, but when we exchange, uh, sometimes it's uh, even better. So the first part uh, will be uh, about the predisposing factor and what we are looking for before doing an ACL, how, how to evaluate an ACL. Uh, the second will be about how to harvest a BTB, how to harvest a, a hamstring, how to harvest a quadriceps tendon. I will speak about the outside-in technique that I'm using and why it's uh, interesting when you do an ACL. Um, then we will move to uh, the why doing an extra articular plasty, uh, and I think it's very important. We do that forever, uh, even before we discover the ALL. And uh, finally, we will finish with the revision cases and how to deal with the revision case. So these are my uh, my things, and all these presentations. I did them, but I didn't do them alone. And I have some Italian fellows who work with me a lot uh, during those presentations. And we call that la légion étrangère en français. With the pair of very strong people. And uh, I have so good memories of uh, working with, uh, with you guys, for sure. So, speaking about ACL rupture, I think it's very important to, to know what uh, leads uh, a patient to have an ACL rupture. Maybe because he's playing uh, soccer, maybe because he's playing uh, basketball, but somewhere you have an intrinsic factors and extrinsic uh, factors. And the uh, <coughs> AP uh, translation is something, the anterior tibial translation is very important, the, the rotation the rotatory laxity is also important, and it's a little bit different be between the AP translation and the rotation. The gender, the age is uh, something important. Hyperlaxity also is important. It's tough to, to uh, rate that, but it's uh, important. And some very strong point in, in intrinsic factors is definitely the tibial slope, and this is one of our focus in, uh, in Lyon. Extrinsic factors, I will not speak about that, but it's also very important. The sports, the muscle, the balancing, and when you, you will see tomorrow with the patellofemoral joint, uh, the, the global balancing of your body, the pelvis, the back is also important, the core muscles is fundamental. So you have to look at this physical preparation, and uh, you know that uh, when you have a very good physical preparation, somewhere you, you, you rupture less your ACL. So about uh, uh, those predisposing factors, we can correct them sometimes. The rotatory instability, hyperlaxity, age under 18 is very important, the revision cases, what can we do? And <coughs> the solution for us is definitely the uh, anterolateral plasty, the, the modified lumer, and uh, we use that uh, most of the time. In Bologna, we have also about a, a technique very similar, which works so well for many, many years. The bony shape, of course, we all speak about the notch plasty, but it's a small thing for me. But the tibial slope is fundamental. And you will see that the slope increases the pressure you can have on your ACL. And you can look at that static or also dynamic. And this, uh, I will speak about that too. And then the intrinsic factors, the rehabilitation uh, program, we use a lot of functional tests before uh, having our uh, patient go going back to sports activities and the uh, isokinetic tests also are important. <coughs> In Lyon, we definitely like to uh, evaluate, rate, and have some objective data. This is probably coming from uh, the patellofemoral joint where we rate the trochlear dysplasia, the patella height, uh, etc. So we want to have some uh, true data that you can measure with, with, a, with a ruler. It will be reproducible, and you can also compare your patient before and after surgery. And this is a good way to do uh, The clinical evaluation is simple. We all know the Lachman test, firm, delay, soft. And this will give you uh, 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 an evaluation about the fact that you have a normal ACL, a partial ACL, or a complete tear. But in partial, sometimes you have a partial functional, 
and sometimes a partial which is not functional, and you will treat them probably uh, dif differently. So uh, the pivot shift now, of course, uh, and when you test the pivot shift, it is something difficult, and I see that with the fellows or the resident when we, you ask them to, to do the pivot shift, sometimes you have an explosive one, and the fellow will have no pivot shift. So this is something that you, you should uh, uh, know, learn, and uh, know how to, uh, to do. And this pivot shift it would be probably one plus. And if you go to this one, where you have a, exactly like a knee dislocation when you do that, you cannot treat the same way uh, the two, uh, these uh, two uh, patients, for sure. <coughs> Is this clinical testing sufficient? To know if you have a partial uh, tear or a complete tear, to know if your partial tear is functional, works well, and is acceptable, or if it's not acceptable. To plan your surgery, to do an associate or not uh, a procedure, and also to plan the rehabilitation program. Do you, uh, is that enough to uh, evaluate your results and compare and rate your procedure? Probably not. And you have to, uh, to, to use your, the, the tools you have. First of all, the X-rays. X-rays, fundamental. And we always start with a monopodal weight-bearing X-ray and a sagittal weight-bearing X-ray. Never forget the axia view, which is important to you. What to look at? You look at for the first to the AP. And the AP will tell you, no arthritis, of course. Look at the lateral side to see if you have a second fracture, of course. This is important. But don't forget also to look at the patella height. This is good. Uh, the patella height will uh, give you some uh, information about uh, your patella femoral joint. Don't forget. Yes, I, I have a call. Uh, the second is to look at the crossing sign. And if, uh, if you deal with, uh, with, uh, with an ACL, the patella femoral joint is important because you can have some patellofemoral pain during rehabilitation. That's why the BTD has a bad reputation, because it gives pain, patellofemoral pain. But it's mostly the surgery which uh, gives pain. And if you have uh, course inside, for example, well, maybe you will have more patellofemoral uh, syndrome. And we have <coughs> more uh, crossing signs in ACL than in the normal population. Nearly 15% compared to 3% in the uh, standard population. So uh, that's something important. Then you measure the slope. And the slope, you have different uh, type of measurement for the slope. This one is one that we use. You take the central part of the uh, tibia shaft and you measure the slope. And also you measure the arteriotibial translation. The fact that when you walk, you will have some arteriotibial translation. <coughs> And this will stress your graft or stress your ACL. So that's something very important. And you have to measure that and put that on your chart. After that, this was a static evaluation. You have to go to dynamic evaluation. And you have a lot of tools to evaluate. You have uh, uh, many of them. Navigation, RSA, dynamic MRI, rotameter, accelerometer with a QR system, which is good. And you will be able to quantify the um, rotatory instability, probably, the pivot shift. In Lyon, what do we, we uh, use? We use the uh, rolling meter sometimes. We stop doing that because it's a little bit, uh, uh, it's, it's not really perfect, but it works well. And if you have uh, not too much money, you can use that. And it's better to have that than having nothing. But we use mostly the TELOS system, uh, and it is done by the radiologist, and you will measure the anterior translation side to side, and you will be able to know uh, how much laxity you have. This patient has 18 millimeter, 18 millimeter side to side. It's, it's a huge laxity. You will not treat the same way as the same who has a five millimeter, for example. So this uh, will uh, show you exactly uh, the amount of laxity you have. And <coughs> we did uh, th this uh, study a long time ago, uh, comparing physical examination, examination in OR, 
the video analysis of uh, what you have as a remnant in your knee and the uh, laxity using the telos. And uh, we were able to uh, have some uh, um, classification of our ACLT before doing surgery. So you know before you go to the OR, before you open the knee, what you will have in your knee. And this is very important to plan your surgery. And uh, for sure you, you, you will be able to make a difference between partial tears and complete tears. And if you use a rolling meter, which is a, a, a very rough uh, uh, system, but it works, you will see that if you have a side-to-side -side between 0 and 5 mm, it's a partial tear. If you are 5 to 10, it will be a complete tear. And this is the comparison between uh, using the video analysis. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's a anatomic compared to uh, this uh, evaluation. And if you use the TELO system, which is more sensible, and you will have more information using uh, the telos, you will be able to have the partial tears, and the laxity side to side will be between 0 and 4 mm. And what means? It means that the remnant you have in the knee is working, and you can keep it, uh, and you can add a graft on, on it, and uh, it's good to keep the remnant. If you are, you are between 4 and 9, it is definitely a partial tear, but it's not functional. So the need to keep this remnant in your knee is probably not really necessary. And if you have a complete ACL after 9 mm side to side, for sure, you know that when you will go in the knee, you will have nothing in your knee. So <coughs> using that, using the pivot shift, you will be you, you, you know exactly what you, what you will have to do uh, an augmentation a total graft or a graft plus an extra articuloplasty or plus an associate uh, procedure and this is uh, important so what about the intrinsic factors and the tibials <coughs> and this if you can understand that it's fantastic it is so so important you will look at the x-rays the monopodal regarding X-rays, for sure, you, you, you look at the George line, of course. You look at the George line on the AP, but also if you have a sagittal, great bearing sagittal, you see exactly the, 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 the George line. It's like a, a Rosenberg view or like a shoes view. Uh, so look at the George line even on the lateral view. Then you measure the, uh, the, the tibial slope. And you, uh, you measure the tibial slope. You take the, the shaft and the medial tibial plateau. Because on X-rays, you can measure only the medial tibial plateau. And then, what you can measure? You can measure the anterior tibial translation. So, this is the distance between the posterior uh, tibial plateau and the posterior medial uh, femoral condyle. And uh, you will be able to grade and um, uh, quantify this uh, anterior tibial translation. <coughs> the normal value of the uh, tibial slope is 7. This patient has 14. 14 is twice. So it is definitely abnormal. And uh, you have to, to look at that and uh, know what, 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 what you have. If you look at uh, all the studies about the tibial slope and the ACL, you will see that it is directly related to the ACL tears. And we have um, quite uh, some uh, new articles re recently showing that uh, the threshold uh, for the tibial slope, slope, the bad threshold, I would say, is 12 degrees. And 12, uh, 12 degrees. This is uh, what we use as a value to correct the slope in revision cases. It's what we have published uh, first. And Pinchevsky uh, published recently uh, another article using the same threshold showing that you have much more ACL tear if you, have, if you are over uh, 12, uh, 12 degrees. So this is something very important. What does the slope do? Uh, when you walk, you will put some pressure on your tibia and you will have some shear forces. And this stretch your ACL. If your ACL is okay, no problem. 
But if you uh, put such pressure on the graft, which is not really healed, you will maybe stretch your graft after surgery and you will maybe damage your ACL, the good job you have just done uh, one week ago. So it's very, very important to, to look at that. We measure that on x-rays. You can also measure the tibial slope on the MRI. You have some uh, studies done uh, by Sebastian Lustig. Uh, and uh, it's uh, interesting because the slope uh, with the MRI will uh, show not the bony slope, but the soft tissue slope using the meniscus. And uh, if you have no meniscus, for example, you will increase your functional tibial slope. And this is something important. So the meniscus are really fundamental also in, in uh, controlling that. We love this uh, uh, static anterior translation measurement. And uh, we have published recently two studies about that. And it is so interesting. You see these two patients. This one, when he's uh, on this uh, monopodal weight bearing, has two millimeter, nearly nothing. This one has 12 mi millimeter when he walks. So when he walks, he puts some shear forces on his uh, ACL and on his graft. So this is something. Uh, uh, to, to look at. And the two studies we have done uh, have uh, this uh, conclusion. The first <coughs> is that the tibial slope increased the static and also the dynamic uh, anteroposterior laxity, but doesn't affect too much the rotational instability. It means that what you have on the sagittal plan is different than you have on the axial plan. And the anterior tibial translation is different from the pivot chip is different from the rotatory instability. The medial meniscus also is very important and has uh, an importance in controlling the static but also the dynamic uh, uh, anterior uh, posterior translation. So this maybe could change your rehab protocol and maybe you can also have a menu à la carte for your rehab protocol using those uh, values. And for an example, ACL and dogs. And the dogs, they have a very high tibial slope, and, uh, around 25 uh, degrees. And the, the dogs, uh, in France, they don't play soccer. I don't, I don't know in Italy. Maybe. Somewhere uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> maybe. Uh, maybe. Uh, but I don't want to say anything here. <coughs> but in France, no, definitely not. So they don't play soccer, but they rupture their ACL. Why? It's because of this slope. Because it does some micro, micro stress on the graft or on the ACL, and finally, it breaks. And the surgery the veterinary, veterinary are doing is a deflection of scotomies. And they don't, do even, they don't even do the graft. They used to do extraticularplasty and they moved to that surgery. So it's, it's very interesting. And we are not veterinary, but sometimes a little bit. The second conclusion about uh, this, uh, the, the studies uh, we have done is that we have looked at the, our patient before surgery, and we have looked at them after surgery, eight months after, and we have done the same, uh, uh, the, the same evaluation. And we have uh, shown that uh, even if you do a beautiful graph, fantastic graph, if you have this, that slope, the graph will not correct the anterior tibial translation you have before surgery. So uh, it means that you have something to do around that, and maybe uh, look at that more carefully. Definitely the median meniscus is so important, so we know that we have to save the meniscus and keep the meniscus because it uh, reduces the functional slope. Uh, for sure. So what can we conclude with these uh, studies is, uh, is that if you have a static anti-articular translation more than 5 mm, this is the threshold we have found, I think that it's better not to allow weight bearing after surgery, at least for three weeks, just to protect your graph.
just to protect your garden. And if you have a timber slope more than 12 degrees, the same. Protect your graft and don't allow your patient to weight bear. Then you will allow them to go back to uh, full weight bearing between three weeks and six weeks. These are our new protocol for uh, uh, our ACL. So this was about the tibial slope. About the notch, what you said? Yes, of course. <laughs> the width of the notch is important, so it's a bony uh, abnormality. We know the classification of the notch, and this is important to know it. Uh, when to do a, a notch plastic? I would say that for myself is um, when my native ACL uh, impinge the, uh, the the lateral condyle, and if uh, my native ACL, the footprint, impinge a little bit the, the lateral condyle, I do the notch plasty. And the notch plasty is important to, to do it uh, at the uh, more distal part, but also on the top of the notch, and uh, enlarge the top of the notch. This is uh, pretty important. In conclusion, we, we are not doing too much uh, notch plasty, and most of the time we don't need to, uh, to do that. Hyperlaxity is also an important factor to look at, and um, for me, um, hyperlaxity is something a, a little bit uh, uh, is, is not really clear. But in ACL, uh, what is clear is that if you have a rigor button, it's something uh, it could, could, be, could be dangerous. And uh, I will uh, definitely do, do something more if I have a big rigor button on my knee. The gender is important, and we all know that uh, ladies uh, have uh, more uh, ACL rupture than uh, male, and uh, this is something that also you have to take care, especially if they are doing some pivot activities, if they are playing soccer, and we have more and more ladies uh, playing uh, soccer. So, using those uh, data, uh, we can adapt and uh, change the uh, menu à la carte and uh, adapt what you will do uh, in your uh, surgery. And uh, definitely with your evaluation, your <coughs> laximetry, laximetry is so important, you cannot do the same surgery to this guy, to this one. It's this one. He has about uh, five or seven millimeter. This one has 18 millimeter. You cannot do the same thing. If you do the same thing, definitely this one has more risk of a rupture than this one. So, um, uh, evaluate your patient. This is the message that we, we can say. So, doing an ACL reconstruction, of course, and uh, you have an ACL here, a soft light man, a little bit of pivot shift. Yes, we can do a, a, an ACL, but uh, maybe sometimes you have to add some uh, additional procedures to your ACL uh, uh, reconstruction. It could be an extraticular plasty or an anterolateral plasty. It could be uh, some osteotomies. Uh, it could be some notch plasties, uh, definitely. In conclusion of this uh, first talk, would be uh, to uh, uh, push you to uh, do some evaluation, clinical, of course, uh, interview your patient, take time with your patient, but also use X-rays. X-rays are really fundamental. And X-rays, static X-rays, uh, dynamic X-rays, or, uh, or accelerometer, or rotameter, or whatever you want, but use a laximetry tool to evaluate your patient. And what, what you use, use the slope, and uh, be careful if you have a slope more than 12 degrees. Uh, know that you can do some exarticularplasty or combined surgery. Don't be afraid of doing a, a, a combined surgery because it's a little bit more surgery, but it will protect your patient and it will give you some much better results. Uh, the meniscus, you have seen that the meniscus is important for uh, the shock absorber, but it's also important for the laxity. And if you, even if you have a meniscus well, you think uh, that uh, maybe it will not heal. It's not a problem. Keep it. Because at the beginning of the rehabilitation, it will protect the, your ACL against the, the laxity. 
And the postdoc protocol is also important. And the weight bearing or non weight bearing is something also important to, uh, to look at. So the conclusion would be that if you have a partial tear, functional partial tear, maybe you can keep the remnant and you can uh, just add your graft. No need to do uh, anything else. And uh, it's uh, important you like doing an augmentation. If you have a partial tear, non functional, you don't care about keeping the, the, the remnant. Except if you think that the mechanical receptor, the vascularization works, I'm not so sure. But you can keep the anatomic uh, uh, position of your uh, ACL and you can do uh, standard procedures. But if you go to complete ACL with a 2 plus pivot shift or 3 plus pivot shift, definitely you need to do an ACL plus something else, plus an extra articular plastic problem. This is the first one.